Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever, wherever you happen to be in the world. I'm Doug Silliman, the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. I, I want to welcome all of you to our program today. How should the U.S. respond to a Middle East crisis threatening its policy and personnel? We have with us this morning an outstanding group of experts to address this very relevant topic. Uh, Tom Friedman is a multiple Pulitzer Prize winning author and columnist for The New York Times. Um, who is always struggling to find clear, understandable language to explain complicated and intractable, intractable problems. Tom, thank you for joining us today. Good to be here. Uh, joining us in a minute will be Ambassador Frank Wisner, who is the Chair Emeritus of the Gulf States Institute in Washington, um, and also International Affairs Advisor for Squire Patton Boggs in New York, but was a former U.S. Ambassador in four countries, including Egypt and India, and held very senior positions in the Department of State and Department of Defense. Robin Wright is a USIP Wilson Center Distinguished Fellow, um, an author and a columnist for The New Yorker, and is one of the country's foremost experts on the Middle East, Iran, and Islamic extremism. She is a highly decorated journalist who has reported for more than 140 countries, so I never knew when or where I might run into her overseas. Robin, we're very happy to have with us have you with us today. Um, moderating today's discussion is Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar here at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. So Hussein, I don't want to delay the conversation. I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Suleiman. And uh, we'll be joined in progress by Ambassador Rosner, and that's just fine because uh, obviously, between um, Tom Friedman and Robert. And there we have Ambassador Wisner. So we're just getting going. Um, and now the gang's all here. So that's great. Um, I'm just sort of going to frame this. We're going to have a conversation and we'll bring in your questions, which can be um, submitted to us via the Q&A function uh, here in Zoom. You're welcome to send them anytime, but we will get to them. I'll curate and moderate them a bit later on in the conversation. Um, I'm there are many different ways of framing uh, the uh, set of interconnected but somewhat separate crises racking the Middle East and um, besetting uh, U.S. policy. Uh, Joe, when Joe Biden came into office, he he uh, partly returned to a traditional U.S. approach in in the region, traditional at least in the d recent decades, which was you know sort of um, to focus on security and stability, and the, the U.S. role as a guarantor of those things. But also, he added um, a regional integration in a way that other um, uh, presidents hadn't, and it wasn't just a matter of seeking normalization between Israel and Gulf Arab countries, but also reuniting Gulf Arab countries with themselves, bringing uh, you know, smiling as they. Um, as they, uh, you know, re had rapprochement with uh, Turkey and Iran, um, trying to um, promote uh, shared infrastructure. I think that was the new, um, the the biggest new factor in in the Biden toolkit was the idea that integration wasn't just a matter of diplomatic rapprochement, but also involved, um, you, you know, um, a, a, a sort of infrastructural projects, both hard infrastructure and and um, cyber and things like that. So, I mean, obviously, that's been thrown completely into chaos by the uh, by the various earthquakes, the reverberations from October seven, and um, I think the uh, sort of way, the main way that uh, I've been looking at it anyway, is that. What what we're looking at, what we're going through now in the Middle East in terms of U.S. policy, and that's the focus of this conversation, is very unlikely to be a, a historical footnote. It's much more likely to be an inflection, a serious inflection point. Um, I just don't see how this won't have major implications for the role of the United States going forward in the Middle East. And what I mean by that is that... Um, no matter how disgruntled uh, re regional actors are and regional public opinion may be with the United States, it's still true that everyone that is interested in a rapid return to uh, stability and order in the region is looking to Washington. There's no one else even trying to do it, capable of doing it, et cetera. Um, and that may be one of the reasons by, that 
where there's so much uh, anger with the United States is the fact that people still feel very dependent on Washington for for that role. And there's no alternative. And that is obviously pretty uh, annoying. Um, and if the U.S. can succeed or be perceived as succeeding because really didn't create this crisis and has limited ability uh, to to resolve it. But if the if the conflict can mainly be contained to Gaza and the other uh, flashpoints not produce a regional war and then in the end the region sort of calms down um i my guess is that washington gets a great deal of credit for that uh, like it or not no matter how resentfully and if it doesn't if the region continues to drift towards a regional war if if the flashpoints continue to metastasize that's mixed metaphor that dreadful mixed metaphor but i think you get the idea if the, if the if the fires spread and start to merge let's put it that way um then i think uh it will be seen as another historical failure of us leadership and uh, american authority and um, the sort of uh, balancing role and uh, calming role in the region will be um, will suffer another significant blow. Maybe not as bad as the invasion and occupation of Iraq, but worse than <clears throat> the red line in Syria, worse than the various JCPOA foibles, uh, and I think uh, really significant. So that's the way I look at it. And what I'd like to do <clears throat> is to ask each of you to respond to that idea and give us a sense of how you read um, this moment for U.S. policy, what the big picture challenges. Give us a 30,000 foot view of what Biden is dealing with and and um, how, how you think it's likely to play out one way or another. I've given my take and that's the last you're gonna hear from me. So um, let's be, ladies first, right? Let's begin with Robin Wright, that's only fair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm honored to be uh, on this panel with such distinguished uh, friends and colleagues. Um, Tom and I go back a long, long, long way. Um, uh, lots of wars and lots of crises we've covered together. Um, look, I think we've actually crossed a threshold. I think, and I wrote a piece last week, that the 10 different conflicts in the Middle East are merging into one big war. And it, not intentionally, not because anyone, you know, s sought to ha have that happen. I think neither Iran or the United States wants a bigger war. Um, I think even Hezbollah, an ally of Hamas, you, you know, not full-blooded brethren, but you know, they're they're political allies, and all of them share a strategic goal of eliminating uh, the United States presence in the region and challenging Israel's right to exist. But when it comes, they all have their own domestic agenda. So we have to be careful when we talk about the axis of resistance and, you know, uh, and the relationship among them. Uh, but I do think that there's now a momentum that's going to be very hard to contain. And um, I, my problem is that, as with the previous administration, there's been a, a preference to kind of pivot to the east, uh, to the Indo-Pacific and particularly China. And once again, you know, we, events on the ground overtook d diplomacy and we thought we were in a good place, bettering relations or at least dealing with the prospect of relations between even Saudi Arabia and Israel. Four more countries, now totaling six, had recognized or normalized relations with Israel. There was, you know, this sense of hope and that we could move on, which is what I think the, um, Americans of both parties wanted mm -hmm. to see happen. But um you know, this was a moment to be exploited by Hamas after two years of training. I, my fear is that as a result, as we looked elsewhere as a country, that the United States is now acting reactively and that we've given up the proactive energy or vision that tries to deal with the bigger picture. And I think what, what uh, Secretary of State Blinken is doing on his current trip in the Middle East is really trying to navigate just one of those 10 conflicts and not doing so well so far, or not having much success so far in getting Israel to accept the idea of a two-state solution down the road um, and a, a permanent ceasefire. You know, there might be something temporary, but there's a sense that, you know, the Israelis are not interested. I think in terms of the bigger piece, the danger is in every past peace process, and I've covered every war since the 1973 war, there has been 
at least one party that really wanted to talk and another party that was pressured into talking. And so you had parties at the table willing to negotiate. The problem now is the two, Hamas and Israel, both have existential goals that are incompatible with any kind of negotiation process. And, you know, how do you get to a point that two very stubborn parties, yeah. um, you know, are capable of sitting down and agreeing to something? So I really mm -hmm. worry that, again, the inability of us to, as a nation to achieve something, the momentum on the ground makes yeah. for a very messy future. That That's really well put. Uh, they also have leaders who are politically invested in continuing the war. I mean, does anyone think Yahya Sinwar and, and Benjamin Netanyahu, either of them wants this war to end? I, I can't imagine anyone seriously does. Um, by the way, Walter Russell Mead has a piece in, in the Wall Street Journal today um, in which he says I, rather convincingly that Iran has uh, the weather gauge, what sailors used to call the weather gauge, the ability to to move in, to attack when it wants, pull back when it wants, and it controls the ebb and flow of battle, um, to use that metaphor. So uh, let's switch to Tom Friedman, and uh, I ask you the same question. I was saying, well, let me pick up on Robin's great uh, introduction. Um, uh, and let me sort of start with Israel and then America. You know, if I look at um, Israel today, um, it's losing on three fronts. Uh, it's losing uh, on the narrative front. Um, although it was attacked uh, um, you know, viciously on October 7th, um, its response uh, and the death of so many civilians in Gaza has really, um, Israel's lost the narrative, uh, I would argue. Um, second, it's losing on the Gaza front, in my opinion, because it has no uh, uh, plan for the morning after. Wars are fought for political ends, and it is not defined a political end that would um, uh, consolidate um, uh, a different Gaza, um, one less threatening uh, to Israel led by Hamas. And thirdly, it's losing on the regional front. Um, uh, Iran has managed to assemble a coalition of allies against it that are squeezing Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, um, the uh, Shia militias in Iraq, well, to the point where it's driven roughly 100,000 Israelis off Israel's western border and 100,000 off its northern border. Um, they've shrunk Israel um, at, from Iran's point of view, very little cost. And what I've been arguing is that for Israel, the answer to all three dilemmas is a, a credible, legitimate, um, uh, um, you know, strengthened, Palestinian partner, a PA, a new PA, transformed PA, whatever you want to call it. I think uh, if Israel engaged in a process with a two-state solution horizon, if Israel had such a partner, I think the narrative would be different. Uh, if Israel had such a partner, the um, end game in Gaza would be perceived differently. And if Israel had such a partner, um, the U.S. and uh, Israel's Arab allies would be able, I think, to confront the regional threat from Iran in a different way, because uh, if you if you look at the fact the Houthis through their rockets have actually completely disrupted global shipping, um, creating massive inflation in the whole global shipping supply chain, I think devastating Egypt because the Suez yeah. Canal is now being really basically shut uh, down. The Egyptian and, economy is destroyed. It's yeah. totally destroyed. And Hussein, how many partners does the U.S. have in that counter effort? I mean, one. Yeah. Great right. Britain. Um, yeah. And so uh, I think if Israel were engaged in a different process uh, with the Palestinians and a Palestinian authority, uh, our ability to leverage a much wider coalition, uh, both to deter the Houthis in, uh, on, on the global shipping and um, uh, uh, help Israel deter the Iranian threat, would be very different. So uh, for me, the question is simple. Um, uh, Israel needs... Uh, to be working with the U.S. and Palestinians uh, to nurture, develop, strengthen, enhance a credible, legitimate Palestinian partner um, produced by Palestinians, uh, obviously, uh, whether it's through the PLO or, or some other way. And uh, the sort of Biden doctrine that I, I wrote about, and, and as I said in the column, that was my invention. That was not something that they've articulated, was just to connect all these dots. It was to say, hey, if we want to deter Iran, um, if we want to end Gaza, um, uh, and if we want to um, produce normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, um, and, and then really create a different regional structure, 
a credible, legitimate, um, you know, well-functioning Palestinian Authority partner is the essential ingredient. And so that's really how I see it. It's also, I think, hasn't occurred to a lot of people on the Israeli right that if you want to defeat Hamas politically, you have yeah. to strengthen their domestic opponents. The, and Iran and Iran regionally, you have to take that card away from that, Iran. So it's, right. it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. OK, Ambassador Wisner, over to you. Same basic request. Uh, give us the big picture. Grand Hussein, thank you, Tom and uh, Robin. I'm delighted to be with both of you. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack, though I start in agreement with Hussein. I believe we are at an inflection point and that the future of America's presence and policies in the Middle East will be fundamentally different as a result of this cur current crisis, however it ends and we don't see the end of it yet. But what I believe is the situation has the appearance, at least at this stage, at this reasonably early stage, it's quite remarkable that it has not spread further than it has. Tom's right about Israel <clears throat> on the northern border and uh, from uh, the flight from Hamas's uh, violence in the south. But at the same time, think about the entire Arab world and go back to the 1970s when uh, the uh, last major contretemps between Arabs and Israelis took place, there was a huge spread of violence, an escalation throughout the region, fundamental effect on the American economy. You can't say that's true this time. We have more latitude for diplomacy today, and I believe the administration is on the right track. Doing, approaching the crisis incrementally you can't get from here to where Tom would like to be and I would like to be to a inclusive Palestinian-Israeli agreement, not the first step. You need a ceasefire. You need to get the hostages released. These incremental steps are underway and they can be built on to create greater calm. I believe furthermore that if you secure a ceasefire today, you will see a sharp abatement of tension uh, in the go in the uh, uh, between the Houthis and international shipping. You'll see an abatement of tension in the Levant, particularly Syria and Iraq and Iranian proxies. Now I say all this because at heart, I believe American diplomacy has a fresh choice to make, and that is how it deals with Iran. It's easy, Tom, to. Uh, take on Iran and blame it. I only ask that when you write your next excellent piece, you don't let anger over Iran cloud your judgment. I believe there is a clear difference in the way Iran is approaching this crisis. If Iran had wanted to create a major escalation throughout the region and push the United States out, it would have done so. That's not Iran's ambitions. And Iran's ambitions, as I read them, are much more limited to, yes, push back American power, yes, to wrong foot Israel, but at the same time to create a balance in the region in which Iranian security will be better accommodated. For that reason, I believe there is an opportunity for diplomacy with Iran that has not existed in the past as much as all of us should and do dislike the nature of the Iranian regime and regret the history of our interactions with it, this is an opportunity to actually shape an outcome that would engage Iran as opposed to try to butt it out. Let me stop there, Tom. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, I want to yeah. shift up the order a little bit and give Tom a chance to respond to that, uh, because, I mean, it it it. It does seem to be the case that for its own interests, in addition to everything that Ambassador Wisner said, that Iran is in some places playing a restraining role. Now, that in other words, Kataeb Hezbollah may have gone too far uh, in by killing Americans. That Iran, you know, under cover of what's happening, and this rarely gets factored in, but Iran is making major progress towards becoming a nuclear weapon state. 
with no restraining international mechanism, no even conversation to make one, sort of under the cover of this conflict, right? And so why would Iran want to push things too far? And that's another level. But but please, I'd like to get your your take on what Ambassador Wisner said. Yeah, I, I if, if you if you think that Iran is um, uh, interested in negotiating um, uh, some kind of stable outcome, uh, you know, in uh, in Yemen, uh, in Iraq, um, uh, in Syria, and on the, the Lebanon front. I'm I'm all for it. I, I I don't I don't object to that at, at, at all. Uh, I, maybe I don't have quite the benign uh, a view of their intentions that it's all just about security, not about their own power projection and um, desire to be the dominant power in the region. But um, I, I don't object to that at all. I I think I'm in between the two of them, uh, Robin. I I I see Iran the, a certain degree of caution in their sowing of chaos. I see them as chaos agents, uh, the way Tom does very much so, uh, and as a revisionist power. But at the same time, I, I also see, you know, a, a certain degree of caution. What do you think? Well, I had a wonderful conversation with an old friend of all of us, uh, Ryan Crocker, who was with uh, was in Beirut when Tom and I were there and has been a friend of ours uh, ever since. And we were discussing just this point, and he pointed mm -hmm. out that Iran is Iran. It was they had the same kind of uh, view of the region and interest in the region during the Shah right. as it does today. It sees three islands off the United yep. Arab Emirates right after it uh, gained its independence. Um, it 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 is the Persian Gulf, and if you even say Gulf without Persian in front of it, um, they literally go ballistic and. Yep. Uh, so Iran, at the end of the day, wants pride of place. It wants acknowledgement that, you know, it was the first great superpower and it can contribute in, in architecture and poetry and medicine and um, energy and architecture. And that um, it has been a player globally throughout history. And I think there's this, you know, revolutions are paranoid. And then you have the Iranians who are paranoid because they are a minority ethnically and as, in terms of their religious sect. And so that all combines for a country that does feel very insecure. <laughs> it shouldn't, but, you know, and the question is, at what point does Iran get to that stage of what Crane Britain calls, you know, the fourth phase of a revolution when it begins to head, head, head into normalcy and can open up with the world? I think there have been attempts at that, but Iran and the United States have never been on the same page. I think one of the problems in foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, is that we always look at Iran through the prism of Israel. And sometimes I think Obama tried to um, circumvent that and do what, you know, have a direct conversation on the nuclear issue. And it went someplace. The problem is the U.S. is deeply inconsistent and that's created a track record that we're not credible. So that even if we do make success, have success during Blinken's current trip, there is a sense, well, you know, in a year with another president uh, potentially in power that it, it could be all thrown out the window. And so that makes diplomacy and, and American credibility all the more difficult. Um, but I do think, you know, this is, and, and again, Ryan Crocker, whom I respect so much, was saying that, yes, we can use our military might to intimidate and degrade the militias and the, you know, the allies of Iran. Uh, but that doesn't solve the core problem. And that is Iran holds the master key. And it could, in many ways, rein in some of these folks and um, deal with the issues that first led them to be created in, in the 1980s and 90s. So, you know, that's the big challenge. And my fear is that we don't have a big enough vision. We kind of get drawn into one, one crisis, whether it's in Iraq or whether it's in Lebanon or Syria or Israel um, or Yemen, and we don't kind of think big picture enough. And... American presidents are are so short and they get, get sucked into the election cycle so quickly that it's very hard to be bold, imaginative, and get something done on on a global scale. Yeah, I do I mean, think we just say one thing. Just saying, I do think we should keep in mind that um, this is an Iranian regime that has spent the last two years brutally suppressing 
uh, a democratic revolution led by Iranian women after uh, the regime killed a woman in uh, in prison for uh, after arresting her for not wearing a head covering. Um, so uh, again, I'm I, 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 if you can stabilize this region through negotiating with Iran, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm not in any way uh, saying otherwise. But let's let's not um, forget what kind of regime we're talking about. Oh no, and no one doubts that, Tom. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've been there enough, and I've had enough friends in Evan Prison. Um, I've been hacked too many times by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Uh, the, the, this regime is evil. But the question is, what do you do about a uh, society? Oh. And and I mean, you know, the rule of thumb in political science is, if you have thirty percent of the population, you can survive because you can man the army, you can yeah. man a bureaucracy, and you can raise enough money. Uh, and the question is, when does Iran get to that point? And the, but that shouldn't be our decision. Um, yeah. And that should be theirs. And right. but in the meantime, the the issue is how do we balance the use of diplomacy and military force? Yeah. And yes, all I'm saying is, you know, limit their ability to hurt us. Make them, you know, try to get them to stop. Make the cost too high. But at the end of the day, we all know that that's not going to be enough to, permanently to to deal with these guys. And I, you know. I don't like these guys in, in Tehran either. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ambassador Wisner, uh, is there a contradiction between um, uh, use of force that is designed to regain the initiative and deny Iran complete control of the weather gauge of the of the of the ebb and flow of, of uh, uh, you know of, of having the their hand on the faucet, turning turning the the water up or down according you know according to. Uh, uh, their um, calculations. Is there a contradiction between that sort of calculated use of force in the Middle East to reassert, uh, you know, the American sort of role uh, and diplomacy with Iran? I mean, uh, it, it doesn't, I don't know. What do you think? I, I doubt it. I think diplomacy ought to be possible anyway. They they want us to speak with them as they're doing exactly that. What's the problem? The Iranians are past masters at manipulating chaos. Mm -hmm. And they are manipulating chaos in the present circumstance. I fully agree with both Tom and with Robin in that regard. Uh, this regime in Iran is of no liking to the United States, but it is a fact. It is a major force in the region and it has ambitions. And to assess those properly in their present context is key to American policy. What's going on? First of all, we now all, I practically all agree that Iran was not behind this October 7 catastrophe and was not ready for it. Uh, it's manipulating its outcome is very true, but Iran didn't want it. Why didn't it want it? it because Iran had made its mind up to shift years. And if you go back and look at the Saudi-Iranian deal that the Chinese were part of, if you look at the American dialogue with Iran in the spring of this year, you see real openings of Iran. And internally, you see Iran, the debate beginning over who comes next in Iran when the supreme leader already of advanced age and unknown health uh, moves on. You're seeing a change in generations in Iran. I'm suggesting that this is a moment in which uh, the Iranians are under a huge amount of pressure at home. They feel the pressure abroad and they feel the need to make changes at home. And in this gives us an opportunity to do two things at the same time, where they overstep or where their proxies overstep we have to use force to push back. But we have to leave the door open to come to agreements that make sense to us. And making sense on controlling the nuclear front, on reaching an outcome in Lebanon uh, that produces a presidency that makes sense in terms of ratcheting the Houthis back, for which there is a history of the Iranians managing uh, the Houthis going all the way back a decade ago. Um, all of these possibilities are out on the table of diplomacy. And it's, this is why we need to engage. I know it's deeply unpopular on Capitol Hill and in established American political circles, but we're dealing with reality. 
we're dealing with the move of power in the region. And that's why I make my appeal for diplomacy. Can I just yeah. pick up on, on, on just one quick thing? I mean, I, Frank, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, just if um, draw red lines where necessary, build bridges where possible. That's why I supported the Iran nuclear deal and opposed it being torn up, you know, um, uh, which was one of the dumbest things we've ever done. Um, I think, and I'd like to hear Robin's take on this. Um, Me too. I, I think it's sometimes um, difficult or misleading to talk about Iran and not Iran's. Because it seems there are multiple power centers there, um, and they aren't always connected and don't always have the same interests, and sometimes do things from one power center actually to undercut the other power center. So, Robin, what, what's your take on that? So, uh, Tom, as usual, is always right. Yes, of <laughs> course. Uh, you know, we we tend to stereotype Iran uh, just like we do a lot of other culture of the countries, and it, there are diverse sectors and. Uh, the one danger, frankly, is that there has been more coalescence around the hardest line elements of the regime, in part because the United States walked away from the deal. Iran thought for the first 40 years of the revolution that eventually they would have renewed relations with the United States and the West, but in a very, very different way, that they would no longer be the puppet, the surrogate, that they would be, again, I go back to pride of place, the, the country that is regionally powerful commercially uh, an asset as a as a potential trading partner, oil rich, et cetera. And uh, they, you know, they made a decision in the aftermath after an election which brought the hardest line president to power that America wasn't its future. And I think when we talk about kind of Iran and, and diplomacy, we have to recognize that Iran has decided that it is, has turned to Russia in, ter in terms of military trade and China in terms of economic trade to, and to give them legitimacy. That's what they think their immediate future is. And it's going to be very hard, I think, to suck them back into any kind of dialogue. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I think we have to realize that the kind of dream of sequential presidents was to you know, get them back in a place where they were not, not equals, but they, but they, they weren't stepped on or ordered around. And... Um, and yes, there's a diversity of opinion. I, I, you know, I'm, I often, when I go to the Iranian parliament, I'm often struck by how similar it is to the Knesset. There are these noisy arguments. And um, at one point they even came to blows. Uh, it, it's less diverse now and Iran faces an election on March 1st for another parliament and it will probably be even more hardline. And that's the drift we've gone. We've gone from having those who wanted, were willing to deal with us to take calls from President Obama um, negotiate. Uh, John Kerry spent more time with his Iranian counterpart, um, Mohammad Javad Zarif, than he spent with any other foreign leader. And so we got to a point where we actually kind of knew each other. And the problem is Americans never really quite under, whether it was the Shah or the theocracy, we never really understood the Iranians. Um, and we're a young power, less than 250 years old. And the Iranians have been around as a power for 2,500 years, you know. And so um, and we're so far away, you know, they have to know us and we don't have to know them. I just think there are all kinds of bridges that need to be crossed before we can get anywhere oh. with. But I think at the end of the day, we have to get we have to deal with Iran one way or another. And I don't think regime change is going to be easy. Well, I don't think there's an alternative visible. And and again, I think after the 1953 attempt to put the Shah back on the throne, we we learn should have learned our mistake back then. Um, no, nobody thinks that, I, I nobody in their right mind anyway, thinks that anyone in the United States can do much to influence who rules in uh, Isfahan and Tehran, places like that. It's just not possible. They, they will decide that for themselves, and you can dream all you like, but it's uh, beyond quixotic. It's delusional to think that you can do much to influence that. But what you can do, maybe, is as well as talking... Um, Take measures to regain the initiative, and that's that's sort of where my concern is, uh, Ambassador Wisner. That that in in the course of what's going on now, um, Iran has too much ability to control the intensity of conflict, where it flares, where it doesn't flare, um, and we are sort of very reactive. And it's precisely because we're a status quo power. I get that. I get that, you know, when you're trying to restore stability, you you are forced into a degree of reactivity. 
um, because you want to be cautious. And uh, a, a revisionist anti-status quo power can be much more comfortable running with, with groups like the Houthis running around breaking stuff. Uh, and it doesn't hurt their agenda that much unless it's something like Kitab, Hezbollah killing Americans pointlessly in Tower 22. So how do you balance that? Uh, I'm asking you an incredibly tough question. There may not be an answer, but I'm asking it anyway. Well, I wish there were a set of perfect answers to your very good question. Um, <clears throat> my own view is that um, the key to the next stage is our ability to achieve a ceasefire. Then we can put the test to the Iranians and others in the region as to what steps they'll take. If you can get Israel uh, to a point where there is a ceasefire that starts with maybe uh, six weeks duration and build on from that, um, you begin to contain the Hamas crisis and you begin to open options that lead down the road towards the Saudi-Israeli dialogue that Tom has very accurately pointed to in his editorial. Uh, you go down the road towards deeper engagement on other regional issues with Iran. The key is getting this crisis in the in Israel with between Israel and <clears throat> the Palestinians in Hamas under control. So I cheer the mm. huge effort that the administration is putting into with yeah. Secretary of State traveling constantly, Bill Burns on the move to get a purchase on the crisis. And from that, you can begin to build. But yeah. we, until we begin to have some uh, control over distrust and violence and anger, uh, then building diplomacy and strategy becomes very, very tough. So yeah. let's move this step by step. It's the only way it's going to occur. Right. It's the only way peace has ever been pursued in the Middle East. There are no grand sweeping gestures. It's incremental steps that get you to your goal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so that brings us right back to uh, something that Tom has persistently been writing about for the past, I would say, two years and even longer, which is that American policy is not only being challenged it, and at its core goal, not just uh, it, strategically, but but in terms of its fundamental aims, is not only being challenged by adversaries like Iran and its network of armed gangs or, or the Houthis or what have you, but also by friends, by Israel, in fact. And that at least on one flashpoint, which I would still say is the most dangerous one, which is between Israel and Lebanon, it's the Israelis that are escalating much more yes. than Hezbollah. They have a, a, an ultimatum uh, on the table. Now, um, uh, uh, Amos Hochstein has come up with a really good plan, um, which sort of, rather than demanding 49 kilometers uh, withdrawal, as the Israelis were, the Litani River, um, he's talking supposedly about eight to 10 kilometers, or that's that's a lot more reasonable. The problem is going to be something like making it look voluntary on the part of Hezbollah. <laughs> you know, they're going to have to kind of pretend they're not doing it under coercion when they are. My my question is this, though. I'll, you keep coming back. At both uh, you, Tom, and, and you, Robin, came, kept coming back to the point that as long as Israel is categorically refusing to entertain the possibility of a two-state solution and is ruling out a Palestinian state and is marching um, rapidly towards annexation, our policies are kind of stuck. And there's not much we can do, say, with normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia on that base. That's it's not going to work. Ditto with uh, defeating Hamas politically. Ditto with making the Houthis look ridiculous and taking away the argument of all of these groups that they are running into. They're doing all these crazy things far away from Israel and Palestine to help the Palestinians or to help Hamas and to hurt Israel by what? Attacking commercial shipping in the Bab al-Mandab. It's ridiculous. But um, it, it, it sort of works because it, because of Israel's policies uh, uh, towards the Palestinians. So Tom, is there, I mean, is there a way of shifting that because it seems to me, according to your analyses, that that's a crucial um, part of gaining, regaining control of the situation. And and there just 
don't seem to be interested. Um, thanks, Hussein. You know, um, really, since you know the day after this government uh, was elected um, in November 2022. Uh, I wrote a column, the headline of which the Israel you knew is over. Yeah. Um, at the time, a lot of people criticized me. It's uh, that's excessive. And it's because I knew some of the characters in this government. When I was a correspondent, there was when Kahana was elected to the parliament. And Yitzhak Shamir, who was then prime minister, used to walk out of the parliament when Kahana addressed it. And now these people aren't just in the parliament. They're in the cabinet and in key positions. So um, it's something that's always been frightening me. So, you know, in the last you know, a few months you're saying I every once in a while I get a, a note from um someone, uh, former officials uh, in Israel or the military, and they say, you know, uh Tom, would you, you know, uh somehow communicate to President Biden that he's got to get rid of BB? And um I say, guys, um that only happens <laughs> only happens in the movies, okay? Um uh that doesn't happen in real life. Um and so here's what I think the administration is trying to do, Hussein, to to address you know that problem that you raised, which is that look, one reason I would argue that this conflict now is so vicious between Israelis and Palestinians is that the worst of the worst are in charge on both sides. The in Hamas, it's the military wing of Hamas, and in Israel, it's the far right religious nationalists who and, and they feed of, off of each other. They have so they just, have a partnership. They, yeah, yeah, and so they need each so, other. Yeah, so I think that the administration's um, strategy is um, to actually present Netanyahu with a choice. And I'll, I'll just reduce it to its simplest. You can be remembered for the prime minister who presided over October 7, or you can be remembered for the prime minister who forged normalization with Saudi Arabia um, and the rest of the Muslim world. But the price of that is going to be working with a credible, legitimate Palestinian partner uh, with the horizon of a two-state solution. To, to put that choice before him, and I think Hussein, most importantly, before the Israeli public. So it isn't just whispered, you know, if you do this, and 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 then they're allowed to, to spin it. So I think that's a key part of what Blinken is trying to do, literally as we speak, to credibly, you know, frame that choice and then um put it before put it before Netanyahu. Um do you believe that they are doing that or do you simply recommend that they're that they do it well i think they're definitely trying they're, that, they're definitely trying with mbs because he has his own interests um uh in uh having not only having a different security relationship with the united states as well as normalization with israel so he has a very powerful interest in that um and uh there are certainly forces in israel who believe israel has a powerful interest in that and there's certainly palestinians um yeah. who believe that and so oh, sure um, uh, so it's a lot of moving parts, going to be an amazing trick if they can put it together. But, um, uh, as, as you, spinning. yeah, as you and Robin noted, you know, if Amos Hochstein can yeah. put together a deal between Hezbollah and Israel, you know, uh, over Southern Lebanon, holy mackerel, you know what I mean? That would be an amazing, <laughs> that would be an amazing achievement, but. But I'm glad, uh, you know, for one thing, Hussein, I'm glad that they're ready to get caught trying. Well, they're, Yeah. And the uh, well, that's right. And then the other thing is, I I think it's possible. I think it's the one deal. I, I've got a piece sitting yeah. with the Atlantic right now where I say that's the one deal that right now looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. If you can just make, if you can just give Hezbollah some kind of cover to mm -hmm. to say that it was like their idea or something. I don't know. I mean, they just they just need to look not that pathetic. But other than that, I think it it's it's a good. Uh, it's a good deal for both parties because why would either of them go to war with each other at this stage? It would just be madness. Um, I get I get why everyone's taking the positions they take. But Robin, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you forgive me for first name. Um, I, riffing off of that, um, isn't this, though, a second term project for Biden? I mean, the election is coming. How How many risks is he really going to take? And isn't that why? They are focused on a hostage for pause deal, uh, not just because it's doable, but because anything much more is risky uh, and that uh, they are being very cautious in responding to the attack on Tower 22, um, very precise in hitting uh, Hodeida and other places, which we went crazy when the Saudis bombed, but you know now we're bombing them. Um, and and the, the whole thing reflects a degree of political caution until a second term if there is a what do you think about that 
I'm not sure that the looming election is defining the course of action right now. I think President Biden is kind of cautious. They want to see, you know, what the reaction is, how far they can go one step at a time. But my fear is that the election will, everyone else is aware of the election and uh, we'll be gaming the fact that we may have a different president and why should they compromise now? Right. Um, maybe short term they <clears throat> engage in a, whether it's a pause and a, a exchange of some of the hostages. I mean, in the long term, uh, Hamas's only real lingering asset is the, are the human lives that it holds. And as we saw with uh, Gilad Shalit, Shalit it, it took five years to free yeah. him and in exchange for a thousand prisoners. And, and Netanyahu has indicated he doesn't want to free any of the Palestinian prisoners, uh, right. even though that's one of the demands. I think one of the things we're it, not thinking about, and I want to bring this up because I was in the Middle East in December, and I was really struck by the kind of conversations we have in Washington and those that are ha being had elsewhere. And I talked to a senior UN official who said um, outright, he, and he spent his whole life there, uh, that, and he's from a neutral country, he's not, you know, not of the region. And he said that we don't understand that even his tennis playing US educated friends in Jordan not, uh, support Hamas 99%, not because they like the ideology with which they disagree, not because they uh, approve its tactics, which they hate, but because they find in a region that is, is a vacuum of ideas and ideologies and isms that Hamas is at least standing up to Israel and the United States. Yep. And so I think we forget that public opinion is a, <clears throat> is a big deal. And <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, the danger of hoping that we're going to get some progress on this, or and even get to a point where we could have an election among the Palestinians and have them elect some enlightened leader, I think be careful because I remember doing the shuttle diplomacy with Condoleezza Rice when she was pressing for that election uh, in 2006 and thought the United States thought it knew best. And I covered that election I, <laughs> days in advance that Hamas was going to win. Oh, you could see it so, coming a mile away. It was a no brainer. And it was a no brainer. And Condoleezza Rice said afterwards, you know, no one told us about this. So yeah, that's not out. true. I, yeah. I can categorically say that's not true. Uh, well, I'm telling yeah. you that's what she said publicly. Oh, no, I know. I know that. That's what and, she said. Yeah, and Who's saying... yeah, yeah the, uh, Rabin said after uh, going after the Israeli invasion, um, he said, no one told us that we let the genie out of the bottle with the Shiites. You know, there was no intelligence about that. So we right. And you get that on the other side, too. Uh, Nasrallah said, I had no idea that's how Israel was going to react. And you can hear Hamas about to say it now. Hamas's friends are about are saying, oh, they had no idea. They didn't know this was going to happen. I mean, I child knows. But okay. whatever. Okay. Anyway, okay. Ambassador Wisner. Uh, can I just finish my point? I have a, oh, sorry. I have sorry. A, yeah. No, no. Hold on. Let's let's you. let Robin and finish. I just want to say, oh, I sorry, think Robin. we have to be very, very careful in understanding that the mood in the region has changed. Oh, and yeah. that kind of slapped me across the face. And all the all of our calculations are based on what public opinion was before October 7th. Yeah. And changed a lot. And the idea that we can make progress or who has leverage. I mean, Hamas and, and the Houthis are feeling pretty heady at the moment, even though yep. they're taking hits that, you know, the people are paying attention to their cause after a long kind of absence. And they think they can, whether it's. Let me let me uh, reiterate that point before we go to Frank, because I, I had um, an email exchange with a very prominent Lebanese political leader who is known for his emotional outbursts, but still is generally pro-Western. And he was all for the Houthis. Uh, and uh, when he when I confronted him with the idea, how is this helping Palestinians or harming Israel? He just said anything that harms the genocidal West is OK with me. And I said, that's nihilistic. Now you're going to be applauding bin Laden. Are you mad? And he just said, well, so be it. You know, it's obviously not um, not in his right mind. But, you know, if you you can even you get there when you look at Gaza anyway. Sorry, Frank. No, no, I'm I've heard those sorts of apocalyptic statements, but I believe the common sense of the region yeah. is to try to get back to some point of stability. Oh, I agree. And Hamas offers nothing but yeah. chaos, right. uh, that while the yeah. image of Israel is deeply offensive in Israel's occupation of the occupied territories, Arabs and general from Morocco all the way to Iraq want this region to calm down. That's a core we can play with. Yeah. 
absolutely an aspiration for American diplomacy that needs to undergird what we think about. I believe second that, um, and I detect a sort of consensus among the three of us, that the track we are on makes sense. That is, as bad as it appears, as ugly as the noises are, we are right to try step by step to build from a ceasefire to prisoner release to relief uh, for the suffering people of Gaza and on down the road. And I believe the administration is committed in that direction. And it isn't the election in this country that's going to hold them back. That what will hold them back is if any of these steps hit a wall and you can't move forward. Because if you do move forward, then Tom's dream of Saudi Arabia and Israel becomes a reality. And one day even, we can imagine we can dream a two-state solution. So I see an evolving strategy that can go on for a long time. But I have to say, I am deeply worried about our own domestic capacity to sustain steady, credible, step-by-step -step diplomacy in the region. I'm literally appalled by the fact that the Republicans have thrown themselves in the way of any relief for the population in Gaza by cutting off any possibility of funding for UNRWA, as an example. That's not the United States. We need to be seen not only as a wise and smart peacemaker, but we have to be seen as a humanitarian. And yeah, we have absolutely. to be seen to operate together with core national strategic objectives we're pursuing. So if we've got an election problem coming up, it's about being able to create some stability in American foreign policy and having a sufficiency of a national consensus behind it. With the uh, general public, it's going to be years to repair the U.S. reputation after uh, support for the Gaza war. Um, with leaders is a different story, um, you know. So I, I I do strongly agree with that. Um, we ha I'm going to start bringing in questions now. We've got Greg Brenner wants to know what you learned, Tom, from your recent meeting with MBS in Saudi Arabia. He asks. Um, you know, it was off the record, so I want to be careful. Um, but I yeah. would say generally what I've written is that um, MBS's vision, um, which is one I've you know, really been focused on since he emerged, um, but now is really crystallized, is to turn Saudi Arabia into a giant Dubai. Dubai mm -hmm. 10X. Yeah. That connects China and India, Africa, the Middle East, Israel, you know, um, uh, North Africa, um, into a um, uh, kind of almost EU-like hub in which Saudi Arabia plays Germany as kind of the anchor of an of a integrated Middle East. That's, that's I think, the vision. Um, uh, and it's it's audacious. Whether you can pull it off, I don't know. But you know, I really feel Hussein today in answer to the question. You really see now two very different kinds of Arab leaders from the days when Robin and I were you know were were bouncing around Beirut. You have what I call leaders who are building their legitimacy through resistance. Follow me. Um, watch uh, my uh, my legitimacy derives from my ability to resist the Americans, resist the Israelis, resist the Shia, resist the Sunni, resist whoever. You know, um, and you have a whole new generation uh, that's emerged in the Gulf with the likes of MBZ, MBS, um, uh, Prince Salman um, in Bahrain, um, yep. uh, who's uh, basically arguing, I want to build my legitimacy on resilience. Judge yep. me if I'm delivering educational resilience, um, uh, skills resilience, um, trade resilience, uh, environmental resilience, um, yeah. all of these things. And you really got a clash now in a very healthy way between, I would say, the resistance leaders and the resilience leaders. And um, uh, the reason I'm so uh, uh, strong about Israel, a Saudi thing, is that if that were, happen, were to happen under the right conditions, which is right. with, an, with a, advancing a Palestinian state, I think it's a tipping point in the region. I think it's a that's such a big move that the Abraham Accords was the mini version, but right. that would be a maxi version that would create its own weather that yeah. would have, I think, a microclimate. Yeah. So that's what no, I mean. no, totally. Um, and the one thing I want to say about MBS is that the big question of a few years ago was: Is, is this guy going to prove educable? 
And the answer clearly is yes. The answer yes. is yes. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. He's a very different leader than he was uh, in uh, 2016. He did a terrible yes. thing with Khashoggi. Um, and, um, Unforgivable. Think, you know, yeah, but, but um, uh, you know, I think we, we have someone who... Um, in that context is is mounting as people as i would i always tell people if you haven't been to saudi arabia in the last two years you haven't been to saudi arabia exactly i couldn't agree with you more um okay we got uh, david mack wants to know why don't our arab power uh partners use their financial leverage to revitalize the pa and make it more effective and credible if they can do that then they could demand the biden administration use its leverage with israel to make it more cooperative and so so in other words that Arabs could take the initiative by um, rebuilding and reforming the PA. Um, what do you think? I think that? that has to be entirely, if I could just say quickly, yeah, uh, you can. that has to be a Palestinian project. Um, yeah. No one can build the PA for them. Yeah, um, there's that. And the other thing is you would have to have Israeli cooperation or you can't yeah. do a damn thing uh, yeah. in Ramallah. You can't, nothing. So anybody else want to um, um, have? Yeah. Uh, Hussein, I've, I've, uh, David's question is reasonable, but it doesn't work if the other pieces are not in place. In other words, you've got to have a ceasefire. You've got to calm things down. The ceasefire has to be extended. The replacement of a security presence of some sort has to happen. And then you can look to Arabs to play their part and provide the economic uh economic wherewithal that Gaza is going to need to survive and rebuild. You can't reverse the order. It has to take place in sequence. Yeah, I mean, I think that's obviously true. Um, all right, let's 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 move on to uh, a couple of questions from some of the smartest people around. Greg Goss, um, unparalleled thinker in, in our field, uh, I think, asks, isn't the core of Iranian power in the region, the breakdown of authority in so many Arab places, uh, you know, so failed statehood, basically. Uh, rebuilding the authority in those Arab states um, uh, is is a long-term solution, but it's very long-term. In the interim, isn't it less about solving, he puts solving in quotes, the problem, and more managing the consequences? Um, I think that's right. But um, Robin, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Do you have any reaction to that? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, I think what he meant is is that um, it, Iran uh, uh, benefits from failed statehood in 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 the Arab world, Lebanon, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Syria, and uh, and and create also creates failed statehood. And that the real way to push back against Iran's use of proxies, militias, to project its power is to rebuild the states, right? Uh, and that in but that is such a, a difficult problem that the real challenge now is to deal with the consequences rather than the the um the the, the cancer you, you have to kind of treat the fever before you can treat the cancer something like that well i kind of think the iranians the iranians went out and very imaginatively uh created an alliance by tapping into the discontent in in diverse countries Remember, it's a, a predominantly Shiite country in a region that is predominantly Sunni. And as a xenophobic um, and prideful revolution, it was very nervous about attempts to undermine it, beginning with Saddam Hussein's invasion in 1980 that led to a, a eight year war, hundreds of thousands of deaths and the use of chemical weapons which, to which the world did nothing. And Iran has gone out and created what it thinks are um, pockets, um, militias that will back it, uh, will help it stand up if attacked by attacking, whether it's Americans or Israelis or others who are threatening it. Um, you know, I always kind of uh, think about its its own little NATO. You know, the United States went out and created. Uh, NATO by tapping into similar societies and countries, shared values, you know, ultimate strategic goals. And Iran didn't have anyone like that in the, in the region. And so it went out and created them. Um, and it's now the most powerful military alliance in the region and one of the most powerful, um, you know, on that continent. And I, again, I think we have to understand why things happen, um, you know, not just you know, 
to, you have to understand why things happen in order to figure out how to deal with them. And this is again, how do you make Iran feel secure? And Iran has often talked about taking the GCC and adding Iraq and Iran so that um, you have the heft of all of the major powers, oil powers, uh, st strategic uh, countries on the, on the Persian Gulf, on the Persian Gulf, uh, yeah. at, who are, you know, have at least have a dialogue and common interests. I think the renewal of relations between Riyadh and Tehran um, was an interesting step because it came at the mm -hmm. same time that Riyadh was talking about, you know, normalizing relations with Israel. Uh, so I think, you know, these big security issues are the ones that that are at the core of everything. And um, and that somehow we have to figure out a more imaginative way. I just think, you know, we can talk all we want about incremental steps. I just think that 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 between administration, the time limit to this limit left to this administration, the time generally that it takes for this stuff to play out, you know, you, you, you kind of at some point we need an administration to kind of early on have a big vision and and try to implement it on one front, not just, you know, these step by step by step. If everybody feels that they've got something to gain, then they may not oppose other steps as part of the plan. And this is where I think we are, you know, when we were doing the Iran deal, the Israelis were deeply opposed and mm. Netanyahu got up in front of the UN and with his little picture of a bomb and yeah. and in Congress. Uh, and so this is where I just think we've been too small in the way right. we approach the region. So that's diametrically opposed, uh, Ambassador Wisner, to your take, which is that great things can only be done through small steps. Uh, so you've got your advocating go small, Robin's advocating go big. What what do you say to that? Small steps, big vision. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have a strategy. You have to know where you're headed. You'll not right. get them. And but getting there is incrementally building confidence and trust um, between the parties and between the parties and your American diplomacy. It doesn't happen with one speech or one action, it has to happen incrementally. I think that's my experience over these decades with peacemaking in the Middle East. Uh, you have to know where you're going and then you have to build it step by step, build it stitch by stitch. But don't we need a consensus? I mean, we're kind of lacking a foreign policy consensus since the end of the Cold War. Um, there isn't anything uniting, um, say, the uh, internationalist vision inherited from the Cold War era, which animates the Biden administration and the neo-isolationists on the progressive left or the MAGA right. Um, there is, you know, that that leads people in other countries to remember the ripping up of the JCPOA, for example. Uh, the potential that a second term Trump would actually withdraw from NATO. I mean, these are real fears, right? Your point is extremely well taken, but sensible foreign policy, the pursuit of of sensible goals, which is what I think Biden is trying to accomplish in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, trying to rebuild confidence with our allies, trying to address uh, our the critically important dimension of China, uh, broadening the aperture of foreign policy to deal with questions like climate change and pandemics yeah. and economics are all part of restructuring an American approach to the yeah. world, getting world confidence in American leadership, participation, uh, partnership, and getting American confidence rebuilt in how all of this serves our national purposes. Right. Okay, so we've got a really interesting question from Nimrod Novik, though it's, it's also very open-ended. He writes, um, as both layers of U.S. strategy, stabilizing Israel-Palestine, forging a regional architecture to check Iran's meddling, are stuck in Jerusalem, with Bibi rejecting the prerequisites of the PA role and a credible political horizon. The two questions are, what could the U.S. do to salvage its strategy in the, in the face of this opposition from friends as well as foes, right? It's getting squeezed from both ends. Alternatively, and this is a really interesting, is there a plan B? I don't think so, but I'd love to hear from any of you, uh, your thoughts on either of those questions. Well, you know, if I could jump in, I, exactly. I, think, um, uh, I think the only way um, uh, to 
answer Nimrod's point is that um, you got to be able to deliver this choice to Netanyahu and the Israeli public. You know, right. this on the Palestinians, and you get this on uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, I don't see any other way um, uh, to do it. And um, uh, and and it's a very I haven't, I haven't really thought of this. It's so obvious, but it's so vital. There is no Plan B. Plan B is to try harder on Plan A. Mm -hmm. Go, uh, either uh, and what's the what's the proof that Plan A has failed? Uh, there isn't a more astute is. observer of peacemaking in the Middle East than Nimrod Novik. Right. Uh, but I frankly am with Tom. Uh, this hasn't failed. This is the right direction. What you're doing, in effect, is making it clear to the Israeli public that we can deliver goals Israelis want, hostages out, calm on the borders, regional calm, uh, and he can't do that. That's the best path we have to proving that American diplomacy works and his bully boy tactics do not work. Okay. Um, Robin, do you have anything to add to that? Well, again, when I was in the region in December, I heard, uh, you know, it made me kind of think quite differently about where we are and to challenge some of the ways we've act, we kind of assumed things would play out, the trajectory, the algorithm of the of the future based on, you know, the rally on the ground today, but things we've done in the past. And I came away kind of overwhelmed with a number of people who talked about how naive the United States was. And um, one very interesting, very involved, very senior person said to me, the Palestinians in Gaza are gonna end up in the Sinai. And I put every single argument out there. Sisi's not gonna take them, they're not gonna go. And, and the official went on who's involved in these issues and said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, out of desperation by default or because actually the, and the Israelis wouldn't mind, the Palestinians are gonna end up and Sisi will take it because he'll get bought out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started, so I went back and I saw some senior, very senior U.S. officials, and I said that I wondered if they were a little naive. And one of them turned to me and said, you got any better ideas? And I think we're kind of locked in a place that we're using the, the, the formulas we've relied on for so long, the approach we've relied on, even though nobody's interested mm -hmm. um, and hoping that we'll make progress and that will lead to progress. And my sense was... <laughs> I came out of the region thinking, dream on. I, I just think we're in a different place. And and it's noble to try. I mean, absolutely. I'm not opposed to any of the ideas put forward. I just, again, needed some input for me to understand how the, the, the various um, variables in the equation are changing. And so you, you think the whole thing is quixotic? Is it doomed to fail? I don't know that it's doomed. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm just an analyst. I'm not. I'm. I've never been. Oh well. Uh, You're uh, a very, uh, very good analyst. Well, yeah. thanks. But you know, I just again, this is where when you're on the ground, you just feel things differently, and and it's not traveling with the you know the administration and hearing their take. And yes, we're pushing and we're making a little bit of progress here and so forth. And I just, as I said, I was slapped across the face with things and I just have to start thinking a little bit more in tune with the, the those in the region. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just answer this question from Michael Broderick really quickly. He said, did, can anyone name an example of a two-state solution ever working in the real world and not just in Syria? Sure. All over, all over the place, right? All the way. In, I mean, three, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that's, that's a four-state solution, right? In Cyprus, you've got two states. In uh, Yugoslavia, broke up into multiple states, and it, it works in its own Ruben way. Ireland. There's no Serbo-Croat war anymore. There's no, you know, Bosnia is, you can make a business and do okay in Bosnia. You're not going to die. Even in Kosovo, you can have a, a normal life. Sure, the answer is yes. So that's that's not a reasonable um I'll, uh, you know um Hussein, so, i would i would say something i've just been thinking about in in relation to that question and kosovo's a sure. interesting analogy is that yeah. um i do feel you know to pick up on something robin said that there's something really primal you know about this fight right now it's just like yeah the, the only word i can come up with primal biblical you know what i mean it just feels like 
we're all talking to each other, but there's a conversation happening between Israel and Hamas, and and it's it's very uh, primal. It's yeah. very primal, yeah. and um, because of that, and because of it has gone on so long, because it's so primal. Not seventy three war tanks and against tanks and phantom jets against you know MIGs. Um, I do think that whatever solution um, happens is going to require an element of uh, American slash NATO on the ground presence um, uh, that previous solutions um, were able to escape. I don't see Israelis and Palestinians in the near term walking away from this deep uh, primal conflict. Um, <laughs> Right. Thousands of Gazan civilians killed, Israeli women raped, the, the whole thing that, that we're going to... It's the worst gonna, moment yeah. in over 100 years of exactly. conflict. And I, I mean, we just the low point, which yeah. is incredible. I yeah. think that without um, a, uh, uh, an Anwar Sadat and without a multinational force Sinai, I mean, that's kind of combination of high and, and uh, on the ground, Whatever solution is going to come out of this, it's going to need something different. I, I'm just uh, grasping at straws here. I'd be actually interested in what Nimrod has to say about this, uh, yeah. because I, I just don't see kind of the old thing. Okay, now we go back to two state solution: Israelis here, Palestinians. I, I, I don't, I don't think so. Right. So uh, there are alternatives, of course, yeah. but um, as long as in Kosovo, where you have actually NATO troops, you know, uh, on the ground, yeah. I mean, there isn't, let's put it this way, there isn't any conflict ending solution that leaves five and a half million, six million Palestinians with no passport of any kind whatsoever. Yeah. Not Israeli, not Palestinian, not nothing. And, you know, trying to fob them off on Egypt and Jordan is not going to work because they're not going to accept it. So there has to be some kind of solution that enfranchises these people or they're going to keep fighting. And that's, that's sort of the bottom line. Um, Chase Winter asks, uh, you know, it doesn't look like U.S. strikes are deterring Houthis or anybody else. That it, it, it other factors like Iranian objections are are getting more powerful. Um, so what that suggests then is that Ambassador Wisner may be onto something. Um, that uh, you know, a, 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 an added layer of diplomacy might be necessary. I don't know. What what do you all think of that? I could begin with you, Frank. I don't know. Well, I'm I'm fully in agreement that. Um, a simple use of military counterforce is not sufficient to reestablishing any stability in the equation. It is, however, a necessary component. You cannot allow and stand by idly while <clears throat> Houthis disrupt international shipping, and you can't stand by idly when three American soldiers are killed in Jordan. You yeah. must respond yeah. Not to reestablish, quote, deterrence, yeah. because deterrence is a shifting ball field, but it sets the stage for diplomacy. Right. The key to establishing a different situation in the Gulf of <clears throat> in, in, in the Red Sea and in uh, the uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq context, frankly, very simply is Let's see if we can get a ceasefire with Hamas. And then go back in your mind to those several fragile weeks when there was a ceasefire, and you saw an abatement of, of violence in the rest of the region. And hold Iran to its word that one abatement leads to another abatement. Right. Uh, we had a question. Is, uh, is this panel resigned to a nuclear iran he, this our our um uh, viewer here seems to think that we are or that you guys are no no right so i think that's the clear answer right everybody agrees nobody here is resigned to a nuclear iran frank speaks for me <laughs> i think we're gonna have a nuclearizing iran but not a nuclear iran but right uh, yeah. yeah there's a big there's a big difference uh any if anybody else wants to I, I just add to Tom's rather magical word, a nuclearizing Iran <laughs> is exactly the way I see it. It's yeah. leverage against us. I remember attending meetings with the Pentagon in the early 90s in which I was told that Iran is on the verge of its nuclear weapon. Um, you have to ask yourself, uh, it's important 
we get back to the JCPOA because that confines the ising end of Tom's statement. But frankly, uh, Iran is not now making a nuclear weapon. I think all of our intelligence tells us that. But and but getting back to constraints around the Iranian nuclear problem must be a core U.S. policy objective. Getting back into something like, not necessarily the exact photocopy of the JCPOA is a critical objective. And yeah. I believe the Iranians are ready for it. Anybody else? Okay, so we've got um, a, a, a question about, you know, that, that it's not just Netanyahu uh, who is opposed to a two-state solution. There doesn't seem to be any plausible Israeli leader or, or um, Knesset majority that would be amenable to that. So, um, uh, you know, how does he deal with that reality? That it, is, it, it may be that the Israeli polity has simply moved on and is determined to go towards annexation. Uh, I guess I'll I'd wait. ask either of, yeah, go ahead, Rob. I'll weigh in on that just because I, I talked to an, uh, an Israeli pollster re recently who made an important point, and that is that every, after every war, Israel has turned further right. Yeah. And at the last election, um, it was 48, 49% voted for right or far right parties. And her estimate is that given the public mood in the aftermath of October 7th, that it could in a in the next election be anywhere from sixty to sixty four percent. So even if uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is not around anymore, or is you know pushed out of uh, power, that the public sentiment is to do much of what um, right. he had wanted. And so I think that it has to be the calculus that we couldn't assume we couldn't put site put this all on one man. That yeah. you know it's a different Israel today, as exactly Tom pointed out. And yeah, that that's you've said that also, Tom, in, in great detail. So I I just don't know how. The, I guess the question is, how do we get around it? But how do we cope with that? If anybody has any ideas, you I, know, I, I think I'd say one thing. You're saying um, if you, you know, my view is until um, uh, the bombing stops um, uh, yeah. in Gaza and Israel gets its hostages back, neither side can even sure. Continue. Yeah, you know, I mean, so like, uh, it's um, it's just, it right. both are just so oh, trauma. It's, it's a long term I mean, question. One yeah. thing though, I mean, I'll throw this. Let me just say one thing about about um about about this to finish, which is that if you listen to what Benny Gantz has been saying, he right. says like, I'm not going to talk about two states, but I'm, I will talk about two entities. Right. And to me, that can be a a bridge back. Uh, I don't know yes. what he means, and I, and that's before the war and where he'll be after the right. war. I don't know, but no, I don't. Right. I don't. I don't think it's hopeless. It's it's a bridge back uh, potentially if if he could get a coalition to work yeah. with that's a big if um, I I just want to throw this out there so the U S in my estimation please disagree with me if you think I'm wrong has never actually had a Palestinian policy or a policy towards the Palestinians the uh, that's independent of the special relationship with Israel every policy we have ever adopted towards the Palestinians is framed warm is is sort of framed through the lens of our relations with Israel and the politics thereof isn't it kind of a prerequisite that for that we finally actually have a policy towards Palestine and the Palestinians that is independent of our policy uh, towards Israel at least a little bit that we can in other words we can deal with them really bilaterally and not always through uh the the frame of whatever israel is thinking i mean i to me that's a necessary step yeah but you know hussein i mean the biden doctrine you know as i understood it and laid it out um the it actually begins with the u.s actually recognizing a palestinian state in in the making or they, we don't know quite what the words will be whether it would go through the u.n security council be a direct american declaration um but it's precisely to address that point where you basically say, OK, we're recognizing a Palestinian state um, as a future entity. Now we want to engage with you on how to build the institutions that will make that state credible and deliver for Palestinians and um, uh, be able to engage in um, uh, a border negotiation slash security negotiation with Israel. So I think to your point, some very radical things are under discussion right now. Yeah. Whether they will see the light of day, they will be opposed by APAC and 
um, yeah. uh, and, 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 and people in Congress. But and possibly yeah. recognizing a Palestinian state right, yeah, or yeah. a Palestinian right to a state or exactly. a Palestinian they're, they're, state in, in theory, in, something like right, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but that is that is under discussion. That we, would be very never, radical. Never seen yeah. that before. So No, 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 no. That's that's brand new. No I don't know whether that could happen, but I'm just saying it's it's under discussion. Right. And I can I can well, make it, arguments. Not only, yeah. Tom, wouldn't you agree it's not only... Uh, it's wonderful that it, people are talking about options like this, yeah. but we have to recognize that it would be bitterly opposed and even strengthen the opposition that BB has to a uh, shorter term, uh, <clears throat> shorter term, incredibly valuable steps, and he would be able to rally opinion behind it. Moreover, I fear. And while I certainly hope that this will not prove to be the case if Trump were ever to return his president, he'd tear it up the next morning. God forbid. So I'm, I, I don't mind paper writers in Washington, options developers busying themselves with this idea, but its degree of reality, David Cameron's speech notwithstanding, is unlikely. Uh, yeah, if you were a betting man, you certainly wouldn't bet on it, but um, since... It's never been in the realm of even discussion. You know, I think it's worth pointing out. And again, I think it's part of, we, to Hussein's point, I mean, we've been self-censoring um, ourselves for yeah. so long. Oh, if we do this, what will the left say? What will the right say? What will APEC right. say? Well, you know, that um, uh, I, for one, would love to see us break out of that. And, and, um, uh, and yes, the initial reaction will be X, Y, and Z. But when America... This giant super tanker turns, it does yeah. create its own wake. And that can, after when the screaming's done, really create a new reality for everyone to adapt to. I think without a doubt. Um, we have a, we're running out of time, but we still have a few minutes. So uh, I'm going to throw this one in there because someone's asking, what about Turkey's potential role in the case of uh, further escalation, given its interests and markedly independent behavior? And I would throw out that. When Turkey acts as a Middle Eastern power, it's arguably the most potent regional actor. It, its power dwarf, you know, um, is significantly greater in many respects than Iran's is. It's a very powerful regional country. It just tends to also think in European and trans-Caucasian terms, so it's not fully focused the way the other Middle Eastern powers are, which which sort of attenuates its role. But uh, I think this is a very interesting question. Does anybody want to address uh, the Turkish factor? If uh, Robin and Tom are silent, let me say that uh, there is always a potential Turkish uh, role in anything that happens south of its border. But given Erdogan and the flightiness of his policies switching side to side, up and down. There's no basis on which one can construct a sustained, responsible Turkish role, not as long as Erdogan manipulates uh, Turkish foreign policy the way he has in the past. Is there a role that Turkey could play if there were a reconstruction effort underway in Gaza? Yes, mm -hmm. of course there is. Um, but Frankly, I think that's a long ways off. So I don't watch Ankara when I'm thinking of what's going to happen immediately in this context. Okay, well, we're we're almost out of time, but I'd like to ask each of you um, a, a final question, which is, if you were advising Biden, what what is the one thing you would tell him he really needs to do next? What is the one thing that, that the U.S. is not doing or not doing enough of? Uh, you have one ask. Of the president, what would you what would you ask him uh, relative to this morass? And again, let's do ladies first. Robin, uh, right, please. I'm going to defer. I don't I don't advise presidents. Fair enough. Yeah, but you have uh, Tom. So go right. <laughs> <laughs> you have advised well, only through I my mean, column <laughs> in your column. Yeah, no, I don't mean in, you know. Uh, you know I, I, honestly, I'm, just, I'm yeah, asking yeah, you to yeah. kind of imagine something yeah. more, you know, substantive. Honestly, Hussein, I think um, you know what I call the Biden doctrine is is the only rational approach, yeah. um, and I think we have to um, you know going back to what Frank and I were saying, if Plan A doesn't work, Plan B is to redouble effort to make Plan A work because there's just no other way. And right. um, 
Uh, otherwise, the whole thing is going to be a giant open sore that yep. will continue to metastasize and just devour everything. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And uh, last word to Ambassador Wisner. Um, what would you advise? What would you prioritize? I would uh, add to the strategy that the president is currently pursuing of uh, the need to return to a dialogue with Iran and get these issues on the table and sort them out, seeking Iranian restraint, understanding that uh, there are words we've given the Iranians we have to keep, for example, release of funds uh, that the South Korean banks were holding. I'd get my diplomacy sorted out so that I could explore the limits of Iranian cooperation. Fair enough. Okay, that is great. Um, I want to thank each of you for being so generous with your time on very short notice, especially Robin Wright, who, uh, I mean, under remarkable circumstances, quickly came to join us today. I, I really appreciate it. This is a great discussion in uh, uh, about a set of issues that are so squishy that it's really very hard to get to 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 deal with them. It's it's like kind of dealing with a giant uh, amorphous blob that keep every poke it in one direction and it starts on another. It's a very, very complex discussion. So I really appreciate your uh, brilliant insights, all of you, Tom Friedman, Robin Wright, Ambassador Frank Wisner. Great, great to have you as a as a guest uh, rather than our chair. Thanks to everybody for joining us and see you in our next webinar. We will uh, talk about the Israeli perspective next, and we're going to give the last word to the Palestinians uh, because their voice, I think, may be the most important at this stage. So next up, the Israelis, and then after that, the Palestinians, and we'll circle back to the Gulf. Okay, see you next time.